Students can be released to their classes, and if you've got your Bible, I will be turning into Psalm 19. And just as you're uh, getting your, your Bible situation in order here, um, as a kind of precursor, let me just tell you, the issue at hand this morning is the goodness of God. The issue at hand this morning is the goodness I agree. of God. I agree, and so the goodness of God, it's, not, it's very interesting because if you read the Bible and you just kind of flip through some of the Psalms and you flip through the Gospels and you, th- you flip through the Epistles and you flip through you know, b- virtually any portion of, of you know, the majority of the Bible, you're going to see statements, strong declarations, strong statements concerning God's love, concerning God's favor, concerning God's goodness throughout the, the whole of the Bible. And so it's very interesting to me that, I mean, just, I'll just quote a bunch because I know we're already in Psalm 19. It says that uh, the Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. That's Psalm 33, verse 5. In Psalm 119, verse 68, it says, You, God, are good and kind and do good. First John uh, chapter 1, verse 5, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. There is no darkness at all in God. He is light. Psalm 52, verse 1, the loving kindness or the goodness of God endures all day long. Psalm 149, verse 5, the Lord is good to all, and he has compassion on all he has made. Psalm 100, verse 5, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Psalm 84, verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing does he withhold from those that walk uprightly. And last but not least, Psalm 34, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. What I find most interesting about that last one, it's, it's a psalm written by David, you know, the man after God's own heart. And, you know, David had some big victories in the kingdom of God. He also had some big fails. But overall, if you look at how the Bible treats David's life and his heart and his, you know, the whole of what he produced, he, he gets acknowledged as the guy in the Old Testament that was after God's heart. And even so much so that God even declares Christ's lineage through, like, relative to David. So he calls Jesus the son of David. And so even though they're, they're you know, umpteen generations removed or whatever, whatever it worked out to be, I can't remember. But that David produced something sufficiently in his life whereby, you know, God was, wanted to acknowledge even the Christ's lineage through him. And so what's interesting, he says in that verse, verse 8 of chapter 34 in the Psalms, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we kind of, I mean, you probably have heard that scripture before. It's fairly well known. It's fairly popularized. It's fairly, you know, often frequently quoted. What I find kind of unique about it is, if you think about it, there's opportunity to not see that the Lord is good, to not taste of the Lord is good. And so the picture I get when I read that verse is there's goodness of God yeah. everywhere, all around you, right around the corner, right in front of your face, right here, right there. There's goodness of God surrounding all of mankind, but it's up to mankind to taste, partake, and see that the Lord is good. And so if you look at even like our, our modern day society, our, you know, what's going on in the world, the people you know that maybe they don't know Christ or maybe they, they know Christ to a degree but they're not fully in, you know, in the game in the kingdom of God and you can kind of see that happening all the time. Like if you think about how people, like what do people do? What do people do with themselves? What, what are, what's the pursuit of, of man at this point? If you're outside of Christ, it's probably, you know, you're probably looking for love, but you're probably also looking for 
money, maybe power, maybe fame, maybe, maybe it's, it's uh, you know, there, there's addictions and there's, there's sexual things. There's, there's all these different passions and pleasures you might go after. There's all these different things that you can be pursuing and, and endeavoring in and, and enjoying even. And ultimately, what's interesting to me is whatever that thing or those things might be that you're pursuing, whatever they are, ultimately, if you trace their, their base element back to origin point, Everything come, came from God. Everything that's good, everything that's pleasurable, everything that's enjoyable, everything that's worth pursuing, it all comes from God. It says in James, every good and perfect gift comes from, a go, from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, in whom there's no shadow of turning. And so you can look at whatever somebody's pursuing. It might be mountain biking. It might be hiking. It might be something that doesn't seem, you know, evil. It doesn't matter. But whatever they're putting above the Lord, whatever they're putting above, you know, you know associating it with his goodness, ultimately you can trace it back to God and his glory. Yeah. And ultimately yeah. you have a choice with everything you face in life. You can say, okay, well, there's goodness here. Am I going to attribute to God? Am I going to taste and see that the Lord is good? And so that's what I want to do today. I want to, I want to go after that thought because I don't know, like it's really easy to be in such a magnificent creation. Like if you think about the handiwork and the craftsmanship of God, in creation. You think about how mathematically precise yeah. the universe is. True. <laughs> Physics, like you can boil down the way like everything works to like equations and numbers and constants, like the speed of light, you know, there's, there's all these different things that like God built so, it's, it's clockwork, it's so perfectly precise, so perfectly predictable, so perfectly seamlessly beautiful in every way, and as we study it, as we learn more and more about it, as we, 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 we you know, accumulate our research and our knowledge and we get our telescopes and our satellites and our supercomputers and all, you know, we've got our, our search engines and our internet, so the, the, the ideas keep on flowing back and forth, nation to nation, person to person. The more we know about the universe, the more it's awesome. Like the more it's like, wow, there's like an atom there. There's a cell there. There's DNA there. There's RNA. There's all this stuff. There's a whole city of activity, subatomic activity happening in every, you know, every little micro particle. Like if you think about all this stuff, it's nuts. It's crazy. Like there's so much ingenuity. There's so much genius. There's so much perfection everywhere you look. You could zoom out as far as possible and look at the galaxies, or you could zoom in as far as possible and look at like subatomic particles. And all of it is this clock-like precision, beautifully working together. And so I just, I just want, to, I want to acknowledge God in what he did. And Romans chapter 1, it talks about how, well, I'll, just, I'll just read it since we're in Psalm 19. For since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Let me restate that. So basically, for all of you know, creation, all of mankind's existence, there's these attributes of God that you, you, they're not visible, they're not perceivable. You can't just like look at them and be like, oh yeah, there's a, I just saw Jesus' footprint over here and there's his fingerprint here. And they're not physical things like that, but you can look at the invisible qualities of God by studying his craftsmanship in creation. And then it's like, look, so his eternal power, his invisible qualities, his internal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. It's interesting, too, in that same chapter of Romans, Paul's rebuking the type of person that worships the creation instead of the creator. Yeah. Yeah. If you read it, he talks about how like, they'll make stuff, they'll carve images, they'll worship animals, they'll, they'll come up with uh, you know, these, these idols and these gods and these different things, and there's nature things, there's earth things, there's, there's you know, planets and, and you know, stars and space stuff, like, but they're coming up with all this stuff to worship and honor and revere when ultimately all of those things are fine and good and dandy, but ultimately all of them came from a creator who na whose name is God. That, that, that's who they should have been acknowledging. That's who they should have been worshiping. That's who they should have been giving reverence to. And so that, Paul's point in saying this is like, look, when you look at creation, you ought to be able to acknowledge and honor God rather than acknowledge and honor the creation. Yeah. 
you ought to be able to say, okay, I've entered into this like building structure. I'm not going to worship how awesome this sanctuary looks or how awesome the prayer room looks and how good the car. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to acknowledge and say, okay, well, praise God for good design. I'm going to praise God. There's an architect. There's a designer. There's somebody who had, you know, uh, there, there's somebody who had the skill to plaster those walls. There's somebody who had the skill to, to build those closets in the prayer room. There's somebody who had the skill to install the chandeliers. There's somebody who had the skill. And so ultimately, it makes sense to praise the, the origin point and not the thing that we're observing, the creation. It's true. So Psalms 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. Yeah. So apparently, stuff up in the sky, apparently, apparently <laughs> stuff up in the sky is talking to us. And I'm not talking about, like, Greek mythology. I'm not talking about, you know, that's astrology. I'm not talking about Leo. and not, I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm talking about, no, God's saying there's, there's something that you can see by looking at the heavens, by looking at space, by looking at stars and planets and moons and stuff. There's, st there's something that you can, you can uh, fathom about God by studying that. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. It's universal. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the earth. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25 To whom will you compare me? This is Isaiah 40, chapter, or chapter 40, verse 25. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? Who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name? Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. So basically what he says is, look, you can't compare me to anybody if you look up at, in the heavens and you look at the starry host, you'll realize that each one I know individually, singularly, I know each star, each planet, each, uh, you know, each um, celestial structure out there, whatever it might be, I know it. I call them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them goes missing. Right. Right. You guys know how many stars there are? Yeah. I taught on this like a year and a half ago, and if, if anybody remembers, then that's amazing. I, I didn't remember. I had to listen to it or look up my notes. Um, so I, you can't count the number of stars because there's, A, there's too many of them to count. It's, it's just innumerable as far as like being able to count it as a human. But then, B, we can't even see them all from our vantage point and with, with the, the power of, of the telescopes and the technology that we currently have. And so what scientists have to do is they look at like sections of the sky and they count that number. And then they're like, all right, well, we can't see this section of the sky, but assuming that the average number of stars here, and, the, and they kind of just do this like super duper sophisticated math equation to come up with a, you know, a reasonable estimate as to the number of stars in the universe. And so these numbers keep on growing as our technology gets better, because they're like, oh, whoops, there's actually you know, a quadrillion stars here, and not, not, just, not just three trillion, there's a quadrillion. And so like, the numbers keep on growing, but like, the latest number that I've seen is one septillion stars. So you've got million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, sextillion, septillion. 24 zeros next to a one. That's the number of stars that scientists currently believe there are in the universe. And what this scripture in Isaiah is saying is, God knows the name of each one of them. Not one of them goes missing by his great power and mighty strength. He upholds the entire thing and he knows exactly what's up with each one of them all the time. And it, that should glorify God. And the, this statistic's a couple years old. Back in the day, two, three years ago, when we had like six billion and change, we were, we're up to seven billion people on earth. But back, you know, a couple, two, three years ago, when there were six billion and change, they said that there's enough stars in the universe to hand out 15 trillion of them to each person on earth. 
So if they're like, oh man, we, we can't keep track of all these stars. We got to come up with a system here. All right, Amy, here's your 15 trillion. You got to manage that. Mark, here's your 15 trillion. Good thing you're pregnant because we, we got a lot of stars to deal with here. Yeah. 15, so whatever the number is now, there's seven, so it's 14 trillion, like whatever it might be, like it's a ridiculous amount of stars. And what's interesting is as you like, if you read about astronomy and you like kind of study the, the, the magnitude of the numbers we're dealing with and the distances and the, the, the energy outputs and all, all these different things you can read about, ultimately what they always end up doing to explain like the number to you they always play games like that. They're always like, well, you'd have to hand out 15 trillion stars to every per because the numbers are so ridiculously massive and they're so, they're so impossible for the human mind to just like think about and actually have like a reasonable idea. They have to come up with these like kind of like silly examples. Like we're not, you know, that, that's the only way to figure it out. So they, they said like, for instance, our solar system, we've, you know, we've got our, our eight planets and the sun. Our solar system is the size of a quarter on the Nevada desert, and the United States is the galaxy. Not the universe, the galaxy. And so we're, we're a quarter on the ground, somewhere in the US, and the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy that we're in, is the United States. Like, that's, that's the size difference. That's, and so, like, you can't, even that is kind of a hard thing, to, I, I can't picture how big a quarter is versus the continental US, like, but that's, that's easier for me to conceptualize, you know, Milky Way versus solar system. There are 100 billion galaxies in the universe that we know of. And that, that, you know, that, once again, this is our best estimate right now. In our galaxy alone, there's 200 billion stars. Our galaxy is 5.87 quintillion miles wide and 5.87 qu quadrillion miles thick. It, it spins, not, not revolves, it spins at a, at a rate of 136 miles per second. But because it's so big, because it's that 5.87 quintillion miles wide, it still takes 225 million years for it to spin around one time. <laughs> our sun. Anybody know what our sun is powered by? You think about Earth, like basically everything, all the energy on Earth, virtually it comes from the sun. Photosynthesis, uh, weather systems, ocean warmth, you know, basically everything comes from the sun. So what powers the sun? Hydrogen. Yep, and it's, so it's, it's basically nuclear reactions at the core of the sun happening all the time. And so if, if you read about the sun, it's, <laughs> its core temperature is 27 billion degrees Fahrenheit. There's 4 million tons of hydrogen being fused every second. So I don't know what, how much hydrogen they'd use like in an H-bomb or whatever, but it's like, you know, a little bit. Like here, here, here's, here's our H-bomb hydrogen. There's the 400 billion, or, the, or the, four, the 4 million tons of hydrogen that's being fused in a nuclear reaction every second in the sun. There's, it's the equivalent energy output of 100 billion nuclear bombs going off every single second. 100 billion bombs going off every single second. The energy output in every second is enough to power the United States for 50 million years. So if we had like some magical device that could just capture the sun's energy perfectly and completely for one second, we would have enough power to, for the United States for 50 million years. Now don't lose track of what I'm saying. This is about God. Like this is about how ridiculously awesome he is. Like this is about how ridiculously, masterfully, perfectly, wonderfully good he is at doing what he does. Now, there are, there are other stars, obviously, um, one septillion of them, actually. And some of those guys burn 60,000 times brighter than our sun. That's a lot of hydrogen, or whatever else is powering those ones. Our sun is the perfect size, type, age, distance, and constancy, and energy output to make Earth habitable. We're like perfectly situated for complex life. Um, it's interesting in Genesis, well, first of all, if you look at the, the creation week, 
after every day, what does God say? It's good. It's good. It's good. So there's your reference point for what God means by good. He did a very, very, very good job yeah. with what he was doing. Like, we're not talking about like, you know, oh, good enough for government work. Like, yeah. this is God saying it's good. Like, he did a, it's very, very good. If you read on in Genesis, he talks about the two great lights in the sky, one to govern the day and one to govern the night. So, you know, sun and the moon. Interestingly, the, um, the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but it's also 400 times further away. And so from our little unique speck called Earth, it just so happens that with our beady little eyes, the sun and the moon are the same size in our sky. But there's no good reason for that to be true other than God is good, and that makes it so that there's two great lights in the sky, one to govern the sky and one to govern the night. Yeah. And they happen to be about the same size. Like it's, it's just like, if you think about like the cosmic like lottery that would have to be won for, for Earth to work. Like they, scientists, they call it the anthropic principle, and basically what it means is it's this principle that says, this is the stuff that needs to happen perfectly for complex life to, to work. So like one of the big ones is you need to have liquid water, you need to have the right elements, you know, carbon and nitrogen and other things. You need to have the right energy output. It can't be too hot, it can't be too cold. You need to have energy distribution correct. You need to have all this stuff happening. So they've, met, they, they've counted like well, what's, what's the stuff that makes life, like what's the base things that need to happen for life to work? And they've come up with like hundreds of these things. And they, they say like, look, if you messed with any one of these several hundred things yes. by like just a small factor this way yeah. Yeah. or a small factor that way, life as we know it would instantaneously and disastrously yeah. cease to exist. Right. Like we would all be incinerated or frozen or <laughs> flung off into like space somewhere <laughs> or the earth would explode or we'd, you know, there'd be solar wind with, you know, supercharged particles, like burning our skin off. Like, there's terrible, terrible things that are all, like, right there. <laughs> if you look at Jupiter, which is our, our biggest planet in, their solar, in, our, in our solar system, if you look at Jupiter, you look at some of those pictures from the telescopes, you know, you, you, you do your internet search. If you look very closely, there's actually, like, this purple scarring on some of the images. That scarring is from when comets that are bigger than the planet Earth hitting Jupiter by, because it was sucked up into the Jupiter's gravitational pull. God put Jupiter on the outer fringes of our solar system so that it would suck up with its giant... It's, it's, it's this massive thing. It's, it's, Jupiter, Jupiter's huge. It's got like... I think it's like 36 moons or something because it's got so much stuff. Like There's so much gravity and, and energy just because it's, it's this big honker of a planet. That like... These comets, like, if you think about a comet bigger than the planet Earth, that's going to ruin everything, like, really quick. But instead of that happening, Jupiter just takes it, takes it on the chin, like, it's no big deal, like, oh, I got a purple scar now, like. Okay, so, I used a lot of that from, um, a teaching I gave a year and a half ago on a Wednesday night. I don't remember the exact date. It was in May. If you guys like that sort of thing, um, I'm sure at the media desk they could look it up and find it. I don't want to spend the whole morning doing that stuff, but I just wanted to give you a taste that that's the sort of God that we have. Yeah. And you can look at creation and see there's his invisible quality. There's his eternal power. There's his divine nature. There's his majesty. There's his goodness. There's his glory in the way he built this this thing. And at the end of the creation week, what was the, the ultimate statement when he, after he had made man and woman? Very good. So if creation, if like the universe, the cosmos, planet Earth, Jupiter, moon, sun, all of that stuff, hydrogen, lots of nuclear bombs, like if all of that stuff was good by God's standards, what does very good do to you? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. you've got, it's just, it's very interesting what his perspective is. He's so ridiculously powerful and so ridiculously awesome. He doesn't care about stars, though. Yeah. He doesn't, I mean, he doesn't, he, does, he didn't, yeah, he didn't make 
stars so that he can like show off to like, you know, he didn't go to some like club in the heavens and be like, yo, did you see all these stars I made? Like I, I got one septillion stars. Like, I did it in a day. It was awesome. Like I didn't even move. I just spoke it and it just happened. Like that, that's not even, the God doesn't even care about that. He did all of that so that he could plant us, his offspring, his children, his, his, uh, his uh, reflection and image into this creation where we can look up and be like, huh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Like, like he, did, he did that just for us. Like He did that just so we could look up and give him glory. And then you can look at like those Hubble telescope pictures and you can see like 50 trillion light years away, yeah. there's this like nebula thing and there's like pretty <laughs> colors and it looks like a tie-dye shirt like in the middle of a galaxy. Like, why is that there? Just so we can look at it. Like, that's why it's there. Like, it's just, it's silly how much God cares about us and wants us to notice and, and pay attention and, and take care of, of our relationship with him. So you guys know the Bible story well enough, I'm sure. He makes this awesome creation. Adam and Eve are there. Things are okay. Things are, things are very good, actually. And they end up, falling from grace, falling from favor, falling from their relationship with God. You guys know that, obviously. We won't go into that. So what does God do about it? Sin comes into the world through, through Adam and, and, you know, temptation and Satan, the serpent, all that. What does God do? Well, ultimately, after some years and some Old Testament stuff and some Ten Commandments and Moses and whatnot, ultimately he comes out with the gospel of Christ. So Christ ends up paying for mankind's iniquities and sins and problems and failures. And that falling from grace is accounted for through the righteous sacrifice of Christ Jesus on the cross. And so anybody who believes in, in Jesus Christ now, and I don't mean believe like I acknowledge him as being like a real person or a real historical you know, there was, it's not about acknowledging historical events about the crucifixion. I mean, believe like there's a trust and a personal reliance on. There's a foundation, there's a devotion where Christ Jesus is, you know, that's part of who you are, your, your trust of him. Anybody who believes in that way with Christ Jesus, guess what? Their sins are completely 100% accounted for and they will never, ever have to face judgment or punishment or condemnation for any one of them ever. Oh, and by the way, he gave you eternal, eternal life, and there's an immortal body coming, and yeah. There, there's lots of good stuff. In, in the original Greek, I, I, think, I think it was Paul who first started using the word. I'm not sure, at least in, 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 writing, in, in writing the Bible. The word gospel in the Greek, it literally means almost too good to be true. And the thing about that word is it wasn't really used when, it was, when the Bible was written because there was nothing good enough to warrant the use of the word. And so Paul using that word and the other epistle writers using that word, that gospel word, this ridiculously good news, yeah. it's almost unbelievable because it's so ridiculously awesome. Him using that word was actually noteworthy. And they're like, whoa, he's calling this the gospel? Like, this is, this is insane, man. Like, what are you saying, Paul? Like, It referred to news that was so awesome, nothing really justified using it. <laughs> nothing was nearly too good to be true in, that, in, that, in their Greek thinking. Yeah. And so like the statement, the gospel of Christ, the salvation through that gospel, we're not talking about like, you know, a Black Friday deal. Like we're not talking about like, a, the, wow, I got 50% off. Like this is all, like we're talking about like, this is like, it's, it's just utterly like, Silly, how awesome salvation is. Um, Pastor Chris once told this story when he was explaining what Jesus did. And it always stuck with me. And I, I just, I'm going to borrow it. I'm sure he's not going to mind. But he, he told us about, you know, when Eve was, was a little girl, just like anybody else, she'd, she'd play outside. And the rule was, you don't go anywhere near the road, Ever when you're playing outside. That's the rule. It was the rule that was, you know, spoken over and over again. She knew the rule. That was the deal. And Pastor Chris and Marge, where they lived on, on Laughlin Road, like, who's, who's living there now? We got Stacy and Sasha and, and, and yeah. So they live on 
this bend on Laughlin Road where cars don't care very much at all no, about slowing down, but it's, it's a very blind turn. And so, like, obviously you don't want kids playing on the road, but you really, really, really don't want kids playing on the road there. Like, it's, it's just, a, it's, it's very dangerous for, you know, for a child to be there. And so one day, Pastor Chris was out doing lawn work. I don't know if he's mowing the lawn or trimming bushes or whatever. And he glances up from what he was doing, and he sees Eve right in the middle <laughs> of the road in the blind turn where cars come flying down. And so he drops whatever he's doing or throws the lawnmower aside and he sprints into the road, grabs Eve, doesn't even look either way to see if there's a car coming, sprints, grabs Eve and hugs her, kisses her, later rebukes her. But <laughs> the point was this, like, he said, like, that's the heart of the father. That's the heart of a father. Like, I'm not going to even look to see if a car's coming. I'm going to throw myself in potential danger. And if I get hit by that car, at least I might, like, I, maybe I could be a shield yeah. For, yeah. for my daughter. Yeah. And so, like, he's like, that's what Jesus did, only he got hit by the car. Yeah. And, like, he knew the car was coming when he went in there. Yeah. And so you, you got to think, like, in, in, in movie language, he took a bullet for us. Like, that's what he did. Like, yeah. he jumped in front of the bullet yeah. that, was, that was going to hit us, that was yeah. meant for us. The, the little red dot was on our chest. It was on our forehead. He jumped in front of it knowing what was going to happen yeah. and yeah. saved us, even though at that time we didn't deserve it. Yeah. And so, like... So that takes care of sin. That takes care of being disconnected from God. But he didn't even stop there. He goes and part of the salvation package deal, the two good to be true news, he comes and he makes his home inside of you. So like you're not, and he promises, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you, no matter what. There's no way you're ever going to find yourself without God. If you trust in him and believe in him, if, you, if, you've, if you've made that connection, you're never, ever going to find a moment. You can go to the most remote island. You can go to the most remote location. You can mess up a hundred times. Yes. If you trust and rely on God, though, yes. he's never, ever, yes. ever going to leave you or never, forsake you. And so he's ma he makes his home in us. And now he doesn't just leave us so that we can kind of tough it out until we die and get a resurrected body. He empowers us and enables us to live out this awesome God-powered, God-fueled, God-inspired life whereby you're moving in your gifts and you're moving in, in your specific design and your specific calling and assignment in such a way that it's supernatural. There's no way you would ever achieve it the way, the way you can with God inside. You, you might be a really good musician, even if you're, you don't have Christ inside, but then if you get Christ inside, all of a sudden your good musician skills, you become anointed. And now heaven comes down as you play that guitar. Heaven comes down as you sing that song. Because now it's not just about your natural skill or your natural talent. Now it's about the indwelling spirit of God coming out of you and manifesting the heavenly presence of God. Yep. Amen. That's the news that's too good to be true. Almost. <laughs> In Romans chapter 8, it says in verse 28, and we know, we know that in all things, God works the good. Yes, he does. Yes, we know that. We know that in yes. all things, God works the good for those who love him yep. and have been called according to his purpose. Yes, true. You know, the Bible promises us that we're going to face trials and challenges and persecutions sometimes. Yep. There's going to be times where your faith will be tested. There's going to be times where you're not going to like your situation. There's going to be times where it's hard. There's going to be times where you're facing trouble. You're facing opposition. You're facing contradiction. And yet, you still can stand on the word of God that he's going to work the good through all things because you love him and are called according to his purpose. It's so awesome. And so, like, God's doing, like, even, even the balancing act that God does here, where he provides everything we need, he intervenes with salvation, he pays for our sin, he makes it so that he's like, all right, all you have to do to uh, have eternal life is obey my commands. Well, what are your commands? Believe in Jesus. That's my command. Oh, and by the way, my, my, my uh, burden is light and my yoke is easy. Yeah. Like, I mean, he makes it so simple to just approach and say, okay, well, here, here am I, God. I receive what you're doing. I believe. I put my trust. I put my reliance in you. And then he does this balancing act where he's like, all right, well, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. And so as you approach a challenging situation, 
I'm not going to just mighty mouse and swoop in and save the day, but I'm going to enable you to tap into my nature. I'm, in, I'm going to empower you to get supernatural wisdom and insight. I'm going to strengthen you in your inner man, your inner being, so that you can navigate those tough waters and still come out, you know, in victorious and blessed and strong and good. And so, like, he does this awesome thing where he intervenes so far with salvation and then he just invites you to walk through that door and trust him. And then he's, throughout the, the, the next step, of the, you know, the next process, he's like, all right, now I want to develop your faith. Now I want, I want to see you manifest my image. I want to see you manifest that calling. I want to see you tap into the anointings, tap into the goodness that I have for you. I want to see you mature and develop and persevere. I want to see your faith go from mustard seed size to, to, to tree size, you know, where the, garden, the birds of the garden could perch on that, the branches of that tree. And so he says, like, look, I want a relationship with you and then I want to actually make you better. I want to improve the quality of your life. I want to improve your capabilities. I want to improve your, your satisfaction, your joy, your peace, the hope that you have, the good things that were already in your life. I want to amplify those things and reinforce them. The things that weren't so good in your life, I want to empower you to, to get past them, to come out victorious. I want to empower you to, to, to exude his culture and his ways and, and, and face off against that opposition and that conflict prediction. Yeah. I quoted this already, but I'm going to quote it again because I think it's, it's timely with the, the portion of the, uh, the, the thought I'm in here. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift, Everyone. it comes from above. Yes, What's yes. the context there? Who remembers it? Anybody? James chapter 1. It, it was, um, don't be deceived, my brethren. Don't be deceived, my brethren. Do not say, do not say that God is testing me. Do not say that God is tempting me. Do not say that God put this sickness on me. Do not say that God caused this tragedy to happen. Do not say that God flooded this thing, you know, messed up my house. Do not say that God did that. For God cannot be tempted or tested by evil. God, there is no evil in him, and therefore there can be no testing of evil through God. And so you've got to look at the situations in your life and be like, oh man, this is really hard. You know, my, my family situation is broken or my, my financial situation is busted. This, everything's messed up in this area. And you can look at that and be like, well, where's God? I don't understand. You're saying to him, he's there, he's good, he's not going to leave me, he's not going to forsake me, he's going to empower me. And you can look at that and like, what's going on? Where's God? And ultimately, you might even get to a point, and some people do, where you say, well, God must have put me in this situation so that he can test me. Or God must have put me in, God must have given me this sickness to, for, for humility, to give me humility. God must, have, God must have put me in this trial so that maybe I can learn some lesson. Don't say, don't be deceived. Don't say, don't say that God is testing me. Don't say that God is tempting me. For every good and perfect gift comes from the book, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, in whom there is no shadow of turning. The reason why it says there's no shadow of turning is because people think there's a shadow of turning. So Paul, or Sir James is making it clear, there is no shadow. I think it would behoove the, the Christian to develop an attitude whereby the question isn't when, or the question isn't if God is going to intervene. The question is, what do I need to do? What yes. action do I need to take yes. to bring forth the yes. supernatural yes. intervention yes. of the kingdom of God? Like, I'm, I just think about stuff like, sometimes like, like okay, we have... Um, we have a property that, that we rent. I, I used to live there, and then when Nicole and I got married, it didn't really make sense to sell it, so we just we rent it out. And I, I confess, I am not the best landlord in the world. I just, it's not my, I'm not like a handy person. Um, it's my, like, if on my set of priorities, it's like down here and not up here just because I have so many other things that I, I have to make more important than it. And so when we have a vacancy in that property, it, in the natural, it's a burden. Like, it's like, oh, man, I've got to, like, do stuff and, like, advertise it, and I might have to, like, fix things, and I need to, like, we got to figure out, like, okay, that rent money's not going to come in, and we were expecting it, so. 
And it's, it's easy when stuff like that happens to like get caught up in the circumstances. And it's easy to start like just thinking only naturally, like, all right, well, if I start advertising today, um, maybe within two months, I'll definitely have the vacancy. Let me, let me work out the budget so that, you know, I'll just assume that it's, it's two months and that's when we'll see rent money again. And I'll probably have to call Mark and he'll, he'll have to make some repairs because, you know, they, they broke a window and I, you know, whatever. And so it's really easy to stay like, completely natural and look at the... But then God showed me, like, well, yeah. why don't you develop an attitude where you're saying, okay, here's the circumstance, here's the, ch- here's the challenge, here's the opposition. I'm like a paper-thin veil away from yes. the glory of God. Yes. It, it yes. could be one faith prayer. Yes. It could be one faith proclamation. Yes. It could be one, sin, you know, one response to the anointing. It could be one confession in faith of what, who God is. It could be some long suffering for a week or two weeks. Or it, it could be any number of things, but you've got to have this attitude where it's like, all right, I'm a born again believer of God. And it says in 1 John that he, he who is born of God will overcome the world. I think that I can handle my Oakdale Road property. Like, the attitude, I'm just saying this, like, the attitude's got to be when you face the challenge, when you face the trial, when you face the annoyance, the inconvenience, the attitude's got to be, okay, what is my goal? What's my job as a son of God to cause the kingdom to come forth in this area? Yes. What, what do I need? Is it just a prayer? Do I need to, because faith always, in, faith always, always, always has action. Yes. There, it's never just thinking. It's never no. just sitting back and saying, well, I'm, I'm trusting the Lord for yeah. help. No, there's yeah. always activity. Yeah. There's always a, a movement. There's always a go. There's always an action behind your faith. Sometimes it's just a proclamation, an out loud statement. But other times it's like, all right, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to, and I'm going to take action as I pray. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take on this situation as I confess the word. And it's not just sitting back on a couch waiting for God to do something. No, it's no. you taking yes. ownership and yes. responsibility and saying, Okay, God, you live inside me. Let's get this thing done. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the meeting in a couple minutes here. Um, let's, all, uh, let's all bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment. If you're here and... You hear what I'm saying, you hear about the goodness of God, you hear about the glory in his creation, you hear about the wonders of salvation, you hear about all the good intentions and the love and the hope and the, 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 just the greatness that God has in mind and in store for his people, for his children, for his offspring. If you're here, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and you don't currently feel like you have that, you don't have that relationship with Christ, you don't have that personal trust and reliance with Christ. You, maybe you had it at one point and you feel like it waned and you, you lost sight of it and you got sidetracked and now it's not, it's not there. It's not t- or maybe you've never really experienced God ever. And now it's like you're hearing about it and you're like, huh, this seems pretty, it seems too good to be true, almost. If you're here right now and you need that, you need Christ in your life, you need that personal trust and reliance with him, you need to know, that, to know, to know that your sins are counted for and taken care of, you need to know that God's going to make his home in you, you need to know that he's there for you, that he's going to never leave you or forsake you, that he's always going to enable you and empower you and take, help you t- take you through the, the challenging situations and the trials that you face. If you're here right now and you need that or you need to recommit that, I just invite you to slip off your hand. I'm not even going to call you forward. I just want to see that you're here and you want to receive Christ. I see that hand. Thank you, Father. Yep, I see those hands. I see that hand. Yes. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you, Father. Now, yes. this is tricky business because I just promised you I'm not going to call you forward and I'm not going to do that because I'm not. that would be bad to lie. But... <laughs> It does say in the Bible that if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. That's what Jesus said to to the people around him. He's like, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. So to some degree, just by raising your hand, you've confessed Christ to me. You know, I saw you. I I saw those hands. Good job with the hands. But that's not good enough. I, 
I need you guys, if you are serious about that, I need you to tell somebody that you invited Christ into your life. I need you to tell, maybe you came to church with somebody or maybe there's a close friend or a family member that you know knows the Lord. Maybe you just have to come up afterwards and talk to me because I'm the best connection you have to God. That's fine, I'll be up here, I'll be around. But you've got to tell somebody, you've got to tell somebody that you either committed or recommitted yourself to Christ. And I just wanna lead you in prayer right now on this This is a prayer that's just gonna help you speak to God concerning that commitment, concerning that trust, concerning that reliance that you're gonna have with him from here on out. And so we're all gonna pray together, so it'll be semi-anonymous, but I invite you, pray the prayer for yourself. Don't just regurgitate what I'm saying. Pray the prayer for yourself and let, let that trust, let that relationship, let that connection solidify as we pray. And I just invite the church to pray along with me so it's, it's, that, it's not that, uh, it's, it's semi-anonymous at least. Father God, we come to you. We want to have you in our lives. We want your salvation. We want the news that's almost too good to be true. We just acknowledge your son, Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, the payment of my sins, the salvation of my life. We just invite that Christ to come into our life. And Lord God, we just commit ourselves to you. And we ask that you, you occupy us from here on out. We thank you for your salvation and the forgiveness of sins. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.